Well, let's get start, started, the whole thing. Um, uh, let me welcome you uh, very warmly. Um, I'm Christos Arvantidis, Live Watch Eric, uh, my colleague Matt Biron uh, from EGI. Um, we are going to, to chair this session. We're going to go uh, very fast through uh, an introduction about the science projects. Uh, and then we will call up our colleagues from the science projects to uh, give their presentations and their demonstrators. Um, Christos, can we lower the volume of the microphone? Yeah, but we don't have, I, I can go, you know, a little bit more back. Is that okay now? Or I can just skip it. <laughs> That's okay. Um, now, um, EOS Future becomes uh, a big figure, a big entity in the current landscape. And when we mean, you know, the current landscape, we mean two things, the knowledge development and the innovation. The knowledge development has to do with the scientific part of that and the uh, uh, innovation mostly with the, uh, with the technical part. Um, in order to make a proper introduction, we will give you a guided uh, tour through the centuries on this process. So the next slide uh, summarizes actually the, some snapshots into the centuries where very significant things happened uh, in this process of the, uh, on the evolution of the scientific thinking and, and knowledge making. So we start with the Greek uh, philosophers. Uh, who, who tried actually to understand the patterns and the processes of the physical world and, and its phenomena. Uh, Aristotle summarized quite a lot of the hitherto knowledge and then later on, I don't know if you see my, the cursor here. Oops, sorry. Is that okay? No? Well, then, I hope it works. A little bit after the Renaissance, we came up uh, with the scientific revolution and the enlightenment, which is exactly the same notion that was promoted through the sciences. A little bit after, uh, the people who compiled the en encyclopedias, they came up trying to summarize again all the knowledge. Um, this has been done uh, uh, already by the 17th and 18th century. Uh, this happened in uh, the uh, uh, 18th century, and by the middle of 18th, we had a huge ramification and a huge, uh, rapid evolution of the science disciplines and, and uh, the domains. But then, uh, at the start of the, uh, ninth, uh, of the 20th century, we came up with this modern synthesis notion, and uh, I think that it started in the 30s with the physicists and uh, for the biologists it started uh, no earlier than end of the 60s, uh, start of the 70s. But the point is how this process advances and uh, how EOSC, the EOSC platform, can support this process. Um, if we look, you know, for patterns uh, in order to uh, explore how does the synthesis among the scientific disciplines and domain occur, uh, we can come up, you know, with many patterns. Uh, for example, here we have the simple uh, pattern which identifies just the commonalities and builds on those. Uh, here we have a, an additive uh, pattern which starts from a basic knowledge synthesis and then we take advantage of uh, the little uh, elements, the innovation elements coming from the different domains in order to build something that accommodates the needs of the scientific community. And here we have a multi-dimensional pattern, which is practically a network analysis that can represent the interactions between the domains and their disciplines. Um, another way to do that uh, is um, um, to go through a multidisciplinary and cross-domain uh, uh, comparison of patterns and processes. But this, to happen, needs to have uh, a fair complete process that starts from the collection and ready of the data and goes all the way to the, uh, uh, the interpretation of the results and the development of the new knowledge. So here is an example. We have two workflows that, that are coming from, uh, from ecology. Uh, one uh, follows the conventional community analysis and the other the metabarcoding community analysis. And they both test the same hypothesis. They come up, you know, with their, uh, with their patterns right here, or the results, and here is the comparison of these results, and therefore the production of the new knowledge. 
and somehow innovation through that. And in EOSC, in order to materialize that, we came up with the idea of uh, those 10 science projects that are being built between uh, the collaborative interfaces of the five science projects, Enrifer, EOS Clive, Panos, Escape, and, uh, and Shock. And uh, we tried to use and develop up to a certain degree uh, the EOS platform so that we can prove that this can happen. And now I'm giving the floor to my friend Matt, uh, who is going to give us uh, a little bit more details on uh, technical grounds. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, thank you, Christos. So now we move on to how we actually do the science itself within uh, EOSC. Um, you've probably seen this uh, architecture diagram before, which represents it's the state of play at the beginning of the current set of projects. Uh, I work within EOS Future, uh, although I'm employed by EGI Foundation, one of the infrastructures. Um, and this was the starting point really of how we uh, uh, took um, the beginning of the state of the art, at the beginning of EOS Future, and took it forward to what we have now. The latest architecture diagram uh, is something a little bit more complicated than this. You may have seen it. It needs a lot of explanation and you can't really fit it onto a slide, so I'm going to gloss over that particular one. Uh, with the exchange, which you've probably heard before, um, there's been a few uh, um, um, meetings so far, presentations about it today and yesterday. This is the uh, repository, if you like, of where all of these external resources and um, uh, resources, um, data sets, uh, software, uh, services um, are put into uh, the architecture. We have the core at the bottom, which is the glue bringing everything together. Uh, so essentially, to do science on EOSC, you need to make use of what is there in the exchange. Uh, the exchange may be found with the marketplace. Uh, which is the EOSC portal front end where you can discover uh, the contents of the exchange. Um, it's now uh, evolving, it's a rapidly evolving project and we now have an open air aspect of it. We have uh, publications, data sets and software entries on top of the providers and resources. Uh, and if you want to have a look at absolutely everything, then you need to change marketplace to search.eosc-portal.eu. Now, there's a little bit of terminology here, so I'd like to uh, just go through it. So uh, we have the uh, different um, services accessible here. We are also onboarding uh, catalogues of services, uh, training material, software interoperability guidelines as well, all available through the EOSC uh, portal. Uh, so we have the exchange and the core, uh, which can be viewed as very complementary here. The, uh, the core making use of um, providing the glue, bringing everything together, making EOSC a reality. And we have the exchange, the horizontal services, the thematic services, SMEs as well. You've probably heard of the term horizontal services. Those of you who are at the previous session, we went into a lot of detail what the actual horizontal services are. Uh, and this is a subset, is an important subset of the exchange, uh, which are generic services or resources uh, that can be used by any community um, to bring significant value uh, uh, to do whatever you need to do. So it can be, for example, uh, computing infrastructure, storage repositories. It could be, um, for example, Jupyter notebooks. Uh, it could be data transfer. These are all horizontal services. Uh, and then we have the, the idea of actually bringing these services and resources together um, to solve the problem. And by this, uh, we call it service composability, which is, of course, the title of this session. You can think of composability as just making use of these different items within the exchange together in order to solve a problem. At the moment, the, the way to do it is manually. Uh, in the future, there'll be a lot more automation to actually associate different items within the exchange together and to be able to connect the dots uh, together to know, uh, to make it easy to, to, to solve your problem. So for example, if you have some particular data set, that data set will be annotated properly with metadata. That metadata will indicate 
what software, what services can be used to consume this. This, however, is not the case right now. You pretty much need to know what to fit together in order to solve your problems. So this is the idea of service composability, which we're doing manually. In the future, we'll be doing uh, automatically. Um, and uh, a very simple uh, a case here is we're running a workflow that can be discovered somewhere um, on a resource from an onboarded repository, um, making use of the computing infrastructure through the EGI Fed Cloud, possibly. Um, um, putting some output data, for example, on B2Safe, publishing that into the open air Zenodo, and then enabling reusability um, uh, as a result of that. And all of this can be accessed through the marketplace, can be accessed uh, through single sign-on through AEI, and then if you need help, you can get it through the help desk. Uh, so uh, on the next few slides, very quickly, you've got the idea of what the horizontal services are from the infrastructures. Um, so we have the ACE, uh, these are readily usable uh, resources that can be accessed uh, through EOS by using an EOS single sign-on, um, cloud orchestration uh, facilities by making use of infrastructure manager, um, registration of host names, for example, uh, a repository of data of um, virtual machines. So if you come up with a virtual machine that is particularly useful for your community, then you can put it onto the VMOPS at AppDB dashboard. Um, and um, uh, there's the data hub as well. Um, Moving on from the computing resources to EU DAT DICE, which are the management resources for data. Uh, you have a number of different resources here. I'm not going to go into too much detail. Again, please refer to the slides from the previous uh, session this morning, covering the horizontal services in much more detail. Uh, B2 Save, B2 Handle, Share, Drop and Access, all of them available through EOSC AAI. And finally, you have the Open Air Nexus, which is the third of the main infrastructures behind um, uh, uh, the EOSC. Um, uh, here we have a number of different uh, resources, publishing workflows, enabling you to create data management plans, pseudo anonymization services, uh, dealing with sensitive data when you do not want the data to be made uh, identifiable. Um, a number of different resources supporting uh, and creating the uh, open air research graph, uh, including res um, usage uh, information, um, uh, processing charges, etc. And many of these can be used straight away without even needing to be registered. Uh, so here um, we're talking about how we're actually supporting these use cases within EOS Future. We've come up with this concept of the showcase integration stories where we specify what is the problem that needs to be solved. This is for help for the scientists. This is the problem the scientist has. This is how you make use of the EOSC portal, the, the EOSC services within the exchange to solve those problems. And then you can see exactly how um, EOSC has helped uh, this to be done, and EOSC has been made uh, more powerful thanks to the capabilities brought by these different um, providers of these resources and, uh, and uh, services. Uh, so with that, um, I think we're on to the actual science cases themselves. Uh, we're giving the um, most mature science cases a chance to give us more information by demonstrating um, uh, what they're doing within the project, what they're bringing to EOSC and how EOSC is helping them. And the first one, I believe, is Ngliki. Yeah, but Mati, do we have the... Yeah, I, I think you did. You're already ready. Perfect. Yeah. Excellent. So, would you like to yes. make use of this? If you go to the folder, no, it's <coughs> oh, not on the side. Already. Yeah, it is over here, so don't worry. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. How many minutes do they have? They have 15 minutes and five minutes. Just check. Just bring it up. Good. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Angeliki. I work with the ICOS Carbon Portal. And I am here today with uh, Raul from EMSO and Cerk from Maris. And we represent the research infrastructures in the environmental domain. Um, we will present one of the science projects in the EOSC future, the one that is called the Dashboard for the State of the Environment. 
I will start with some general information, then Cerk will give you a teaser of what is happening at the provider's level, and then Raul will explain to you the technical requirements to develop a, use, um, a, a service as ours, and he will also demonstrate um, uh, the, the application. So, let's start with the idea of the dashboard. Um, I think many of us will agree that two of the hot topics that concern our modern societies are the climate change and the trustworthy information. Now, we are research infrastructures uh, that operate in the environmental domain, and our work, our job, is to provide good quality data and services to the scientific communities that follow us, the communities that we serve. So we thought that if we come up with a list of environmental indicators that result from our data, um, we can combine them in an easy to use um, service application that has the form of a dashboard. And we can provide this to our users so that they can um, capture the state of the environment. Now, such an application, this dashboard, uh, it would serve different uh, user groups. Um, starting from the general uh, public, so basically people that would like to know more about the environment, but also giving access to data and services for more advanced users as scientists that work not only in academia, but also in the industry, with policy makers or with uh, citizen science projects. Um, how do we work now in this project? So first, we have to start at the research infrastructure level where we have our providers. The providers need to set up the analytical workflows that will guide, that will bring the data to the dashboard. Um, these workflows need to be combined, need to be integrated so that we can feed the same, um, um, uh, the, the same service. This is exactly the point where we have to think interoperability. This is where we have to consider that we should become interoperable not only within our community, but also going beyond our um, uh, scientific community as we will be able to be uh, harvested by higher level integration platforms. By, um, so in, uh, in the Envry uh, cluster, we have developed our own test bed where we test our services for their fairness. Our goal is to become more fair, and the more fair we become, the more interoperable we become, and this would enable our services to be harvested by these uh, higher level platforms. An example is obviously the USC, and by joining the USC, this is how we want, we uh, achieve, uh, we get the opportunity to reach larger communities, and we also demonstrate the benefits of our web services that provide scientific data. So we started uh, this, uh, experiment, this use case, with research infrastructures from the uh, environmental domain, as I said. We uh, start with uh, uh, infrastructures that come from three environmental fields, and this is the atmosphere, the ocean, and the ecosystem. So, as I said before, these arise have to, um, or th they have to do the first layer of work. And now I will invite my colleague, Jerk, who will explain to you an example of workflows that they develop in CData. Hello everyone, <coughs> so you're just stuck with me for one slide, but here I try to break down how CDataNet goes from an EOV, which is uh, a name for or derived variables that are very important for climate research. So we start off with the EOVs, in our case, temperature, oxygen, pH and nutrients. And in order to feed that into our API, the CDataNet API, uh, we require the parameter names that are actually related to these EOVs. And for this, we use a semantic broker, which talks to the NERC vocabulary <laughs> service, which is hosted by our partners in uh, the UK, BODC, uh, which is a huge database of uh, marine, mostly marine, um, keywords, vocabs. And uh, we send them a Sparkle query with the iAdopt properties. And what we then retrieve, for example, if we send them an oxygen EOV, uh, a list of parameter names, such as docs, M, Z, Z, X, and uh, many more, which we then can use into our filters for our CDataNet API uh, in relation also with a depth filter, a time period, and a bounding box. Um, and then we use the CDataNet API, which we developed this year, um, to subset from our large CDataNet database, which contains more than 2.8 million uh, datasets, 
Um, and if we then apply these filters that you see on the screen, we can obtain just one single uh, data file, which can be a CSV or a, a NetCDF. Um, and it also goes very quick. It could be a few seconds and then we get all the data. And also with this uh, connection we have to the NERC vocabulary service, we also actually have the opportunity to do a unit conversion on the fly. Um, because you know if you have oxygen measurements, some people measure uh, in millimoles per cubic meters or in per liter. So there can be a, a huge variety of actually different units. Um, and we want just one uniform data set because as a researcher it's very easy to work with them. Um, and if we then obtain this one uniform data set, uh, we go on one hand, we can go to our map viewer which we developed. Um, so we can dive more into detail to this data. Um, we can select a certain time period, depth range, and then go into the map and um, well, see the, the results that we obtain from our API. Um, but as this map viewer is still in development, um, we are not ready yet to onboard it to EOSC, but in the future when it's TRL7, uh, we can. Um, and on the other hand, we have the notebooks where we uh, make these indicators that we use to feed to the dashboard. Um, and it's very easy to start our notebook just with that um, post request to our API because then we can on the fly start working uh, with the data. Um, and in the future when we also have other blue data infrastructures that we um, use as input to our indicators, we also want to use uh, the computing softwares or the horizontal uh, resources that Matthew just uh, mentioned to, um, yeah, to help us with that. Um, I think that was it. Oh yeah, and no, also we have EuroArgo, which we have a similar workflow for. Um, but uh, there are certain nuances, but we also use them and display them on the map viewer and also use them as input to our indicators. So I think the floor is back to you, Angelique. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. So now you get an idea of what is happening at the research infrastructure level. This is only one example, right? So more workflows are being developed so that we can um, uh, feed data to our services that come at the front end. Um, good, so we started from this deeper level, I usually call it like the, the very back end, it's not a very technical term, but <laughs> that's how I can describe it. And now I want you to think that we are moving to the surface, and I want you to think of the user. We have a user that they need to know more about the environment. They want to visualize, somehow, the current status of the environment. Either they have a scientific background or not, the these users need to find, to, uh, they need information that is easy to find, easy to access, easy to understand, and it also uh, results from trustworthy uh, sources. For all these reasons, our users will go to the EOC platform, and this is where they are going to look for the information they need. Now, in the EOC platform, they will look for environmental data or for trends uh, related to the climate change and so on, and they will end up in the, uh, on the dashboard, which is one of the EOC use cases. Now, here the dashboard can demonstrate two layers. It can work in two layers. At the surface, at the front end, the environmental indicators that are provided with the workflows that Jerk just described, they um, um, they find their way to the, the, the front end, which is a simple to use interface that Raul will show in a bit, and they answer the, the user requests. Now, behind the dashboard, this is exactly where everything happens. This is where uh, we have the EOC engines working. Um, here we have the EOC services, and as EOC services, we define, first of all, the core services that are offered to our providers, who uh, make use of them so that they can enhance and improve their own services so that, first of all, they can answer the user requests, improve the user experience, and so on, but they can also um, continue developing um, and improving their services so once they become technically ready, they, also, uh, they are also onboarded on the EOC platform and they become EOC services. So as we started with the Envry community, our goal and our ambition is to allow our dashboard to continue growing, attract more contributors, so more providers will join this, and the platform will continue growing. Now to summarize, before I give the floor to Raul, um, we are developing different services, and those can be expressed at different uh, levels. So at the front end, 
we develop an easy to use application that can um, answer, that can um, uh, help the general public, but also scientists to get access to data and services from the environmental uh, domain. At the EOC level, we demonstrate the benefits of joining an integration platform, uh, that, and more specifically a platform that supports scientific workflows and um, uh, products that address the needs of the modern societies. Um, our goal and um, our aim is to engage more scientists uh, in, this, in this work, not only as end users, but also as providers and co-creators. And of course, in this collaborative environment, we want to strengthen the links with the ENVRIs, and of course, we want to increase visibility of our data products, but also provide scientific results that answer, uh, that um, help uh, achieve the goals that we set as societies for a sustainable future. And with this, I will invite Raul, who will give you the technical requirements uh, for this, and will show you how to engineer such a design. Yeah, State name and organization. Okay. Thank you. I'm Raul Barraji from MSAERIC. I'm part of the IT group of the MSAERIC. And I'm here just to, just because I'm, I'm working with the development of this dashboard that we are going to see. But before the demo, let me show you some technical information. Here you have the links to the front end and the back end. The back end is also with an API and a, an interactive documentation is also deployed. And it's very easy to use, okay? So normally the back end is for machine to machine, but in this case we, we did a documentation that even humans can use it, okay? Then the source code will be here. In is, it is in our GitLab, and we are following the best practices to make this project. Maybe sometimes this is the reason because we are in some parts slow, because you know the best practices are not the fastest practices, but in our case we are trying to do all the best that we can in other parts. We are using a lot of different services of EOSC. For example, for the authorization, we are using the, the EOSC uh, AI. And then we are using the EOSC Cloud provided by the EGI. We have two, ser two data, ser data servers, one in Spain and another one in Italy. And with this, we can achieve the redundancy and the high availability of the services. And then we are working, well, the onboarding is already done from yesterday. And we are working to include the service monitoring and the help desk, okay? And this is very simple, but this is how it works. The user can connect to, the, to the, this user interface, that is the dashboard. And then the dashboard is connected to the API. We have an internal backend, but what Angelique said and, and our, all the partners of the research infrastructure are telling about the backend is not the backend that I'm talking. Eh? The backend <coughs> that I'm talking here is just to manage the dashboard. Okay? The API controls or manages all the data that we need internally in our backend and also the data that is coming from the research infrastructures, so the, 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 the data providers. Okay? It's quite easy. Now let's start with the demo. I have prepared the demo with the slides, but I prefer to use the browser and show what we have now. I think it's better. Okay, as you can see here, this is a work in progress and demo version, blah, 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 blah. Okay, the dashboard is divided in frames. Here you can see three frames, and then here you have more frames, okay? In a frame you have different parts. The title, that always, you need to configure this part, I will show you later on. Then the logo, and then you can configure what is doing the logo. So when you click the logo, what will happen? Then here you have the indicator tab. 
that contains the information that is provided by the research infrastructure and is the real information that you want to show in this framework. Right? Okay, for example, in this case, the marine domain want to show a plot of different parameters, but others, for example, actress, icons, they want to show a plugin. So this plugin and this plot is not done by the dashboard, it's done by the research infrastructure or the data providers. And this is the basic, basic uh, thing that you can see if you are not authenticated. Okay. Then, I'm going to authenticate. You can do with your credentials also. Keyboard is different. Is that the keyboard? Yeah, I don't know how to write. <laughs> Mati, can you help? Um, C, yes, there. You click that. Uh, you can change the English. I'll just set this switched with, uh, with Y. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so if you access to the dashboard with your credentials that are with the, um, the EOSC AI, so you can use even Google if you want, um, you are going to see these three tabs here, these three buttons. Those are to manage all the things that you can check and you can see in your dashboard. For example, you can delete one of the frames that you are not interested. Okay? You can move the frames also. And then you can add more frames. For example, I'm going to add this one that is what uh, I just deleted. So you can configure your own view of the dashboard. Then, if you want to create a new frame, because, I mean, the, 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 the amount of frames that we have now are very limited, you can complete all this form, and then it's, it's very simple, and a new frame will be appear. Only for you, if you select as private, but you can share this frame with everybody if you put the visibility as public, okay? And another way is to download a configuration file, like this one. You can select JSON and YAML. I'm going to select YAML. This is a YAML file. It's a text file. It's very easy. You can open with all the um, text editors. And then, inside, you can change the different parameters and then upload again with this button. Here, you select the file. And then, if, I think it's easier if you download the, f the, 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 the configuration file you modify in your computer, you decide what to write and then upload. But you have the two ways. And I don't have more time to continue, so that's all. But yeah, if... Two more minutes. Two more minutes? Okay. Excellent. So... You've been granted. Oh, I don't know how, sorry. I don't know how to do this. I'm going to change again the keyboard. I'm going to use these two minutes to, to just write things here. Yeah. No. <laughs> okay. Um, the, um, I, I, I would like to show you the API documentation, but it's not necessary. It's just for developers, okay? But, uh, um, what I want to say with this one minute more is that we are developing something that is completely open now. Everything, what I'm showing you is what we have and the last develop, the, the last release was two days ago. So maybe in some days you will see some difference. And in this case, this is a product that we are developing but is for everybody. So if, please, if you think that maybe something can be useful for you or your team, or you have uh, something to say about how to do, uh, I don't know, maybe you can add a frame, something, just write us an email, and we will try to add to, to this project. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Raul Angeliki. Do we have any questions, Mark, at the back? Hi, yes, this is great. Uh, it was great in September, it's better now. Um, when we talked in September, the conversation was that you had a, you, you have an API to, to allow people to access the contents of the each little tile, little dashboard tiles. Yeah. So it, it, you know, if you organize the tiles, then you are essentially organizing the information for other people to take advantage of. So that's one question. The second question is, is can you, is there a, is there a formal fashion for defining all the inputs? So for example, there was EOV, uh, referenced in uh, your, your short presentation. So how do I get the EOVs? Uh, you know, is that a defined format? What other possibilities do we have? I don't need a complete answer, but I'm interested in how those pieces work, how this kind of, uh, you're, you're achieving composability from native source data sets to an organized presentation and potential reuse by other people. So just trying to understand what's possible. Do you want to answer? You can answer for the EOV, how you use the Like on the EOVs off of uh, ENIS or CMIP files? Okay. Do you want to start? I'll mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll start. So for the EOVs, we just have a set of seven EOVs that uh, we yeah, from previous projects that were deemed to be very important for like ocean research in general, and they are very, very abundant um, because there's a lot of measurements in these types. Um, of course, there can be other marine parameters added in the future, but for now, with the coverage that we have from our blue data infrastructures that can provide us with the marine data, these are the parameters that really make the difference and where we can show a lot of different uh, indicators from. So that's how, from the marine domain, how we decided to use those parameters. Um, and yeah. no, 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 no more questions, please. We yeah, need to. we should have time at the end uh, for everyone, uh, but we should move on with the other demonstrations. Just, just to add to that, um, a lot of the results that you see here, they result from the projects that we have in the ENRI cluster. So basically, from the ENRI fair uh, project that will uh, uh, that will finish next year, our domains. Um, adding one more because we have four environmental domains, they have developed their uh, own demonstrator. So we make use of these results, like the EOV, the EOV is one part for the ocean. Then we have also the atmosphere where they have agreed that this is, um, we give priority to this kind of uh, variables so that we can express them in indicators. But of course it's work in progress and as we attract, as we invite more people, more contributors, it will be nice to create um, stories, uh, user stories too. Yeah. Okay, we should move on to the second demonstrator, uh, which is Reagan talking about the COVID-19 as demonstrator. All right, so good afternoon, everybody. So my name is Reagan Karki, so I'm representing EU principal from ITMP, and I'm joined by my colleague and partner, um, Instruct Eric. Unfortunately, our Eurobioimaging partners are not here, so we are just there on our behalf. Sorry, yep. So uh, we have uh, the title Imaging Data in EU EOSC, and for that we have used COVID-19 as uh, our test science project. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I think a few of the things had already been covered uh, in the last few days, so what the, the um, community issues are and what are the things that needs to be addressed, provided to different research institutes. So I think in our um, situation, so we are faced by very high volume of uh, imaging um, data that is produced in, in high content screening experiments. And uh, so we have a problem with, with um, operating with this data in a cloud platform. And then what we need at the imaging community is an efficient and open image data sharing among all the researchers, research institutes. And I think this, uh, the, the, two, the two other points are very much aligned to the FAIR principles. And here, what I want to emphasize is, um, if we consider, consider the FAIR principles, I think the findability and accessibility is well uh, deal, dealt with, but, but then the interoperability and the reusability is, is a major issue. And these are the two factors that actually determine the quality of any kind of research data. And we, we do have some issues with standards that are being defined in imaging data and other biochemical um, 
data that that we produce and yes yeah, so we would like to address these issues issues these issues with with our test science project so uh, our test, our scientific uh, case in a nutshell. So we are three different uh, research institutes that specialize in three different domains. So with Eurobioimaging, they are the experts in, in dealing with um, imaging files. And uh, what they have done in the science project is created a workflow where uh, different kinds of uh, bioformats, actually I'm being told that there are 150 different types of imaging file formats one can have. And for these different kinds of file formats, our colleagues have developed a workflow where would be converted to one standard form, that is the JAR file format, and then with this workflow you can also initiate the process of submitting your own data into public repositories like the uh, bioimaging archive. And with uh, our Instruct Eric colleague, they have developed a web service known as the 3D Bionauts, 3D Bionauts web service, which essentially um, shows you or visualizes the, the 3D structures of proteins and then uh, chemicals, and instances of uh, protein binding with chemicals, their, their active binding sites, their domains, and then pockets, all of this stuff. So I would say as a, um, like active user of 3D Bionauts web service, I would say they have um, really uh, used the resources of Uniprot and um, PDB, and then integrated it, and then level up all the things that what one can do using these two other databases. And on our side, um, I'm the guy uh, like uh, representing Fraunhofer, uh, ITMP, doing all of the knowledge graph stuff. And then for this science project, we have taken all of the um, chemicals and compounds that have been tested in various different uh, EU open screen partner sites, they, uh, integrated them, and then developed uh, a knowledge graph that represents basically the chemotype and phenotypes of, of COVID-19. And so how we uh, work together is we, we, we are able to migrate from one end to the other end um, because we, we have semantically and then, um, you know, like using ontologies and different vocabularies, we have mapped and integrated our data together so that people from any domains can, can simply tra traverse to the other direction for uh, downstream analysis and all this stuff. So. Uh, now, coming to the EUX uh, platform, uh, the, the science project, what are the technical requirements or what we expect from um, EUX is that they bring together our projects, uh, they bring together institutes like us to, to develop resources and then, you know, like services for, for the wider scientific community. And then I think um, in this science project, we have been uh, yeah, brought together. And I think the second point would be the, the resources we built um, so might not exist when, when the project is over, but in this case, we definitely are hopeful and we are pretty sure that EUX will help us to do, um, maintain its sustainability even after the project is, is uh, over. And I think um, as, as, so we are the developers, the users would have other needs, so we expect EUX um, as, as a project uh, to, to create this kind of environment for, for the other users, create um, you know, like different user-friendly interfaces, how in order to uh, use the resources we have been building. And the last part is definitely related to this. So the 3D Bionauts web service is already part of the EOSC um, core uh, catalog of services, but, but uh, the, the workflow at the Eurobioimaging and the knowledge graph workflow is yet to be uh, onboarded into the marketplace. So this is the things we, we expect uh, from, from um, EOS. And uh, the, the, for, for the fact, uh, what, what is the added value for research institutes like us being part of these test science projects. So I think uh, the resources we built are being brought to the wider community um, by the EOX platform, where, so where you could, like users can go to the marketplace, look for resources, they, they are quite interested. And I think uh, in that um, EOX marketplace is doing a wonderful job. And I think uh, the, the other aspects of the EOX uh, yeah, core services where they are accounting, help decks, monitoring, collecting data, uh, uh, co co connecting different users and, and communities is, is nicely done uh, with the EOX, which we as independent research institutes are not capable of doing. So uh, as I mentioned before, we have a couple of things that have been already achieved, but then uh, for the 3D bio nodes, the, the um, 
monitoring and health checks is, is already the tax is already started and some things that are to be done next is the accounting for services for 3D buy notes and then also the uh, COVID-19 structural hub which is another inst instance of 3D buy notes dedicated to COVID that would be done and uh, yeah so we expect also the horizontal services of, of the EU horizontal services says to include the workflow of um, Euro bioimaging and the COVID-19 knowledge graph um, probably before the uh, review we have at the end of this month. So next what I'm going to do is uh, we have created some two or three minutes video for each of our research institutes where we actually show how we um, perform our task and to start so three bio notes is in the heart of our collaboration so I have a small video over here so I will play it and also give you a brief uh, yeah, walkthrough on how it actually works so if I start it here so as you can already see so we are at the EOX uh, sorry I, I know the video plays on my side but why is not there actually checked if it actually works before the presentation but maybe if you don't go full screen put it in the slides. I think just the slides are being shared at the moment. Uh, how do I switch that okay, to the full screen? That's good. Oh maybe click on the oh, if you're on the black area can you click? Here. I think this is screen okay. this screen is not being shared, so I'll try to put uh, it here. Maybe I'll come back. I think we need to stop the sharing from this side. Maybe now. Where was it? Uh, but can you just let play there? Was it in this one? Yes, uh, I think it was in the browser here. Yeah. Uh, not this one. Which so uh, I think this is the first oh one. For, for us, I think we have better yep. So this will. Okay, I think we are there. Good. So we are at the uh, marketplace. We are looking for three D buy notes. So it, it's there since last last six months or even more. So we have basic information here, and if we click at the details, we can see what different languages is the web service available at, and what are the different projects that actually funded. Uh, to, to develop these resources. And now once we get into the three by nodes uh, web service, so we have a sample uh, example where it directly takes you to this exact protein called the spike glycoprotein. And then this is the 3D structure of this protein which is freely movable. On the right hand side we have information that is being integ integrated from Uniprot and um, uh, PDB, and then if you click one of these M sheets here, so the same thing will be highlighted um, on the M sheet and also ex directly on the 3D molecule itself. So this is how uh, this is being built. I think there's this other video that explains more. Uh, not this one. So. Okay. Sorry, I will have to take it here again, so I'll play it from here. So this is the second uh, demo about the uh, three bio nodes. So we have this uh, separate instance of the COVID-19 edition. So here we have all the PDB structures, now the structures of uh, protein, and then we can filter for all of those proteins that have been annotated uh, with the um, Eurobioimaging workflow. So if from here, if you 
find your like enough interest, interest then it, it will directly take you back to the original resource from where um, the information was taken. So this is one instance of the image repository. So we, here we have one um, screening experiment which represents all of the wells where this particular chemical have been tested against specific cell or any protein and these are basically the information if you click on each of these wells it will provide you the uh, the associated or corresponding metadata from there and then uh, i think if i move this away so i think we here from here we can continue with the slides and this is um, what will be uh, built or incorporated in the next few weeks so this is already ongoing so you already saw the interface here and now we are in a place where uh, we, we have the um, connection or the integrated data from the idea directly being represented in the 3d bio nodes so here for example we have this particular protein replicates protein 1ab um, and then what we want to have is the associated um, high screen content experiment uh, that is also being registered at the idea and here instead of showing all the wells it will only highlight your show you that particular well where your your protein is present and then if you just move your cursor there over it on top of it you will be shown the idea id and then once you click there you are again taken back to the um, original resource where uh, you can see where your protein has been tested in that particular well okay and i think coming to the um, yeah dissemination of, of the three bio nodes so our colleagues have already published a paper about it it's already onboarded on the eox marketplace and uh, so there were a couple of poster presentations that has been done for, for this uh, web service and you can also access it directly from the original uh, link now coming to the uh, euro bioimaging workflow uh, i think i have another video over here might have the same issue Sorry, I think I need some help again. Uh, I'm not able to click the link. <coughs> Sorry, it's the link on this page. Can we right click it? Yeah, especially when we're using Windows. So usually, if we go to full screen mode. So there should be a button that actually plays the video. Okay. Ah, maybe it's working now. Okay. So. So in this video, uh, I'll show you how one can submit uh, your imaging data to do by image archive. Uh, so we start off with selecting some files that we we have in our hands. So this is a .tif file, and we are going to first convert it to a .jar file, and then initiate the whole process of submitting it to the um, bioimaging archive. So once we selected the file, we create a workflow, and then we name it uh, however we want it. So in this case, we want it to end up in the bioimaging archive. So we say, uh, yeah, convert it from NGFF to um, bioimaging archive and then uh, so this this is an interface like um, like the NIME where you can create your own nodes connect different nodes and wherever you have previously uploaded data and then you simply have to save the workflow and then run it so that uh, this gets executed yep okay so I think uh, we we are pretty much on time and then once that is being done, so our data has been converted to JAR. So this is the first step. Now the second step is um, submission to the bioimaging archive. And before that, if the users want, they can also play around with some of the parameters of, of the imaging files, like changing the height, width, and also the resolution. 
and once done, you can name a folder what you want to be um, in the, on the other side of the bioimaging archive, and then you just run the workflow. So this actually depends on how big is the data. So the imaging files are pretty, pretty big. So yeah, sometimes it might take 15 to 20 minutes if you have large chunks of data. And now here we are at the submission phase of the bi um, bioimaging archive, where all of the things we did are directly uploaded here. And once you are here, you can have a metadata file, and then you can uh, end with the submission process and then after a few days the reviewers are going to review it and then accept it and then you'll have your imaging data in the bioimaging archive. And with that uh, I think we have last bit of um, demonstration of the case as well that is also pretty short. So I think the dissemination plan are also going pretty well. Um, so it's still to be onboarded into the EOX catalog of services but then it's already there in the workflow hub and also in the tool set in the Galaxy tools. And there's already um, a couple of workshops uh, our colleagues have participated including the EOX workshop in the past. And now coming to the knowledge graph. So this is just two minute video here. So this is the entire workflow. So we have obviously like biochemical entities on our hands. And then these are basically derived from Campbell or PopChem. And then could be also be human proteins and also viral proteins from different resources. And using the Campbell and um, Uniprot API, we extend the information on top of these initial seeds um, on, on different ages like the diseases, mechanisms of actions, all the active assays, assays where these chemicals are found to be uh, more and more active and stuff like that. And then here at the end, I have also a small video. So this is the noise graph. We have two different uh, proteins which are very much uh, related to the monkeypox virus. And so the 3D nodes uh, link has been annotated on, on all the proteins here. And if I click the neighbors here, so I will see all the associated ases with this protein. In this case is, is the uh, biological processes. And I'm also doing the same for uh, all the second protein here. So this actually shows us all the biological processes and we can readily see what are the commonly shared biological processes between these proteins. And here I have an assay that says I have two different chemicals that are found to be active against CD4 um, with this ke uh, ke chemi Campbell assay. And I'm looking for yet another protein because PPAR gamma is a really known protein. And then of course there are many uh, uh, assays that have tested uh, PPR gamma. And if I click on one of these assays over here, so I expand this node showing, asking, okay, show me what are, are the extended nodes. So this is a chemical. So if I double click it, so from um, this chemical node, I'm able to see what are the different diseases that have been tried to treat uh, with this particular um, chemical. And then, um, so once this is expanded, these are blue in color. So we also have the information of side effect. And also, uh, I think for example, we have taken the HIV infection. So not just this chemical, I want to know what are the other chemicals that have been uh, treating uh, HIV inf infections. And uh, so you also end up with all of those chemicals that are integrated into the knowledge graph. So this is how the knowledge graph actually works. And last, last bit of information I wanted to show was the, the annotations of the proteins with the 3D bio nodes, because being within the knowledge graph, you can directly come in here um, and find that particular protein, its, it's substructures or molecular conformation provided by uh, 3D bio nodes, and then perform your own research further. And I think with that, uh, so the KZ decimation, so I think that that's the last slide. Uh, so it, it's in process, we have already submitted a paper, uh, done a couple of yeah um, poster presentation submitted it also at the biomodels and then yeah so this is all we have done so far and I think uh, uh, the question and answers thank you it's done at the end thank you, Matt, thank you. one quick question before uh, we move on as we move on as we <laughs> move on yeah uh, Mark <laughs> so uh, really good demonstration of, of uh, shall we say, virtual research environments, scientific gateways, platforms, or whatever. You're doing stuff inside the gateway. You want to show the gateway. You want to list the gateway in the uh, smart place. You go in there. You access a bunch of good stuff inside the box. 
The question I have is all the things that are inside the box, are you going to put them outside so that when I click on PPARG in, as, a, as a thing in the EOSC uh, discovery marketplace, will it take me to the right VRE so I can start exploring the relationships with P PPARG? And then how do you export the stuff that you're learning? If you're, you're looking with your eyes to see stuff, but how do you export that into knowledge that other people can get, or does that not happen? So I think uh, that is something I didn't explain, but all of these instances of knowledge graph you use, so this can be saved at any time, and you could save it, and then also distribute it with the other colleagues, because these are simply instances of this knowledge graph, and you can work on the knowledge graph for a while, save it, come back later, and start from the same point. So I think uh, with, uh, that, that actually comes on the aspect of visualization. So creating knowledge graph is one aspect, but visualization is another different task um, that can be done in different ways. So right now, the knowledge graph I have shown is being visualized with the neo 4 j um, infrastructure, and it can be done with Jupyter Notebooks, Cytoscape. So we, we can export our knowledge graph into different formats. And I think uh, in the last re uh, rehearsal meeting, we had a talk that um, th there should be an opportunity to uh, host the knowledge graph directly from one of the EU ser e EU services. And that's something uh, yeah, I'm looking forward. Good to do. Yep. Thank you very much. OK, last demonstration is Lucas uh, covering the dark matter. Yep. Um, Detection. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to uh, come here. So uh, I'm a professor at the Technical University of uh, Munich, and so I'm a particle uh, physicist, and I'm here together with Misha. And we're both physicists, but we're from different scientific community, and we're using EOSC and uh, our test science project to try to find some uh, common uh, ground. And so just as in a nutshell, kind of what we're talking about. So uh, you might or might not know that, uh, like, from the matter content in the universe, actually, we don't have any idea what 85% of the matter content is. So everything that you see around you, every table, every phone, every uh, human, is uh, the, all that, every galaxy all, uh, only accounts for 15% of the matter content in the universe, and we're completely in the dark about what the uh, remaining 85% is. And it's one of the major research topics in particle physics, and so this is called dark matter, uh, because we ju just don't know uh, what it is, and there are uh, many types of indications uh, that this exists. And so we're uh, looking for it in uh, many different ways and uh, so it's a very multidisciplinary uh, science driver to search for dark matter um, and uh, it kind of touches many many fields from astronomy to physics so there are many ways you can try to study or find dark matter so you can try to create dark matter in the lab so this is what we do at CERN for example we try to smash in known particles and hope hopefully we create uh, so far unknown particles you can also try to find uh, dark matter particles that uh, are kind of uh, flying through the universe and uh, you know they hit the earth and then interact with standard model particles and so this is the d direct detection uh, and so here we are basically trying to observe uh, dark matter or you can see that maybe in the universe dark matter is interacting to each other uh, with each other and then emitting for example light particles and so on and then we might observe these remnants of dark matter interactions and so uh, dark matter is a very kind of cross disciplinary uh, kind of research topic and uh, so uh, uh, if we kind of try to find dark matter uh, so this uses some of the most complex experiments that we have built as uh, you know, humankind. So we have the experiments at the Large Hadron Collider. This, this, this is where I work. So this is the Atlas experiment uh, at CERN. It's a very big kind of, you can imagine it as a three-dimensional camera uh, trying to uh, take pictures 40 million times a second. Uh, but then th uh, there are also experiments that are looking for, uh, you know, what is coming from the universe. So you have neutrino, neutrino and gamma ray telescopes in the, uh, deep in the ocean, deep in the ice at the South Pole, or uh, deep in space, uh, right? So we have satellites lights and then you see these different uh, telescopes that are uh, submerged and this is a different uh, scientific domain from mine but it's also uh, kind of sensitive to dark matter and it's useful to try to uh, search for dark matter. 
Uh, and then you have uh, these direct detection experiments where we try to find interactions from kind of uh, dark matter that is just hitting the Earth. And so these are very, very kind of sensitive experiments that are submerged deep, deep underground, uh, very often in uh, old mines. Uh, so because uh, it's a very hermetically sealed environment. And so uh, they basically try to find dark matter uh, directly. And so examples are dark side uh, and Lux here. Okay, so uh, then, uh, you know, one of the issues that we're really grappling with is that uh, kind of these cutting edge uh, meta experiments are increasingly unique. There's only one big large hadron collider in the world, and so these are very multi billion, you know, complex multi billion uh, dollar uh, kind of experiments, and uh, they operate at the uh, kind of exascale, so we have an exabyte of data at the LHC, and so uh, these are really kind of unique experiments, and uh, what is kind of our, you know, responsibility is to try to maximize, uh, you know, those experiments science output as much as we can. So we want to create, of course, new data analyses, but then we want to combine multiple data analyses within these experiments and also across uh, different experiments. And then this allows us to reinterpret kind of existing studies in the context of uh, some new theories that might come up, you know, far, uh, you know, uh, later after the uh, kind of uh, data analysis has been prepared. And so uh, all of this complexity basically implies that we also need very uh, complex infrastructure, uh, you know, for our science platform. And so the idea is that uh, with EOSC we have a partner uh, where we can build like uh, the tools that we need uh, in order to you know facilitate some interaction between these scientific communities and kind of learn about dark matter from all the different angles, so from astrophysics, from particle physics, uh, and so on. Okay, so. Uh, you know, we haven't found dark matter right now, but we hope uh, that maybe we uh, might found, uh, find it in the future. Uh, the reason why uh, we could be hopeful is because there are many uh, experiments that are coming online now, and so we have an unprecedented sensitivity uh, to dark matter if it is out there. Of course, this is not something we control, but let's say uh, it is uh, out there and, you know, we could find something. This is what a possible scenario could be. So you, we might see in the late 2020s uh, some small hints of direct detection, um, you know, that's somewhat compatible. Uh, with what's called WIMP dark matter, uh, weakly interacting uh, massive particles. Uh, and then uh, these uh, uh, hints might be kind of confirmed by different experiments. So very often we build experiments that are, uh, you know, uh, complementary in the technology they use and so that we can kind of cross check and so on. But this, of course, requires that the data is public and that we can somehow make this uh, cross examination. Uh, then uh, in the mid 30s, uh, we uh, might have uh, kind of uh, confirmation also from uh, the indirect detection uh, where we have, uh, you know, maybe some observation of uh, dark matter and signal, so this is uh, dark matter particles smashing into each other, converting into energy, and then, uh, you know, this uh, produces a signal that we can find with a telescope. And then, uh, you know, maybe uh, in the future we are building a future collider where we can directly probe, you know, what the nature of dark matter is and you know, how it interacts with the uh, matter that we already know. Um, okay, so... Uh, Putting all of these different uh, puzzle pieces together, you know, what such a possible uh, scenario could be requires really a common and open computing and data infrastructure so that we can kind of share the data as it's, it's coming online and uh, we can uh, kind of see, uh, you know, how all these uh, different pieces uh, fit together. Um, so as part of EOS Future, basically what we're trying to do now is we try to build like a platform that uh, integrates all of these different angles and how we can uh, look at dark matter. And, uh, you know, uh, we've been... So the idea is that, okay, we want to do our science, but also as part of the entire EOS process, we want to provide input on kind of for our scale of experiments and, you know, science uh, domains, uh, what service and what, what kind of uh, kind of infrastructure is actually needed and will help us kind of extract as much science as we can uh, from these uh, very complicated, very expensive experiments. And uh, so as part of this uh, kind of pathfinder process, we want to build a prototype that enables us a unified view across uh, the different uh, science domain, so uh, we've uh, selected a few uh, kind of uh, participating experiments as a prototype. Uh, so we have one experiment uh, from the direct detection side, which is dark side. We have a collider experiment, which is Atlas experiment. And then uh, Misha is working at uh, uh, an experiment called KM3Net. And then we also have uh, satellite uh, experiments that are participating in this thing. And so we have all of these different data sources, and we try to uh, you know, integrate them into one unified uh, platform.
Okay, so then as part of this uh, test science project, basically, uh, we are also creating a science output. So it's not only about infrastructure, but we also want to, uh, you know, uh, prepare, uh, for example, an uh, uh, overview analysis on, uh, you know, that proves the uh, um, kind of the complementarity of the different participating experiments. And then what we're also hoping to do is to combine these results statistically so that we can, uh, you know, extract uh, much stronger limits uh, than any one of the experiments could do. And then as uh, part of the more more infrastructure side, but uh, on the data and software side, we basically, uh, you know, tested different uh, um, infrastructure pieces where we deposit the data into the Escape Data Lake, which is one of these five uh, uh, projects in EOS Future. Uh, and then uh, we have our uh, software and software pipelines uh, kind of archived in the uh, Escape Software Catalog, which uses Zenodo as a kind of backend. And uh, that should be then ready to be reused and reproduced uh, kind of at a, a point's notice. Um, okay, so uh, this is kind of the science background, and so I'll now uh, pass it on to Misha to kind of walk you through a little bit on what the platform uh, looks like as we have built it right now, and talk more about the kind of technical uh, aspects. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello for everyone. Uh, my name is Mikhail Smirnov, and uh, thanks, Lucas, for a very comprehensive uh, review of dark matter. And now we are uh, diving to uh, the virtual research environment and what is uh, that exactly. So here you can see that how uh, these web pages look like. Uh, we have here uh, two TSPs actually. It calls uh, dark matter TSP and another test sci uh, science project is uh, calling Extreme Universe. And all other services are integrated in this uh, VRE platform. So, uh, what is actually uh, the core of uh, virtual research envi environment? So, here, as you can see, we have um, maybe I will call highlight. So, so how the to red one? Ah, the red. The red. Yeah. Uh, so here we uh, we have a user, and the user u using this escape a AAI uh, federated with kiosk, and then you're uh, going directly to uh, VRE. Inside uh, VRE, you, uh, you may able to pull uh, data from the data lake, and also you can use uh, access to software repository. Then a uh, user can build its own uh, workflow uh, analysis and produce some scientific significant results. And after that, uh, these uh, scientific results can be published uh, using Zenodo. So basically, this is uh, the core of this uh, virtual research environment. Uh, now, if we are going a little bit deeper in, uh, in the pieces of uh, VRE, uh, how it, it works. So first, it uses uh, EOSC Federated uh, ID, uh, Identity, AI. So here, how it looks like. Uh, if you're uh, the member of uh, ESCAPE and uh, your uni uh, university or institute belongs to ESCAPE, then you should have an account and uh, using this account um, you should have like a credentials or probably like X509 certificate and you, then you may able to have access to uh, VRE. So after uh, entering uh, VRE, you, uh, you have a marketplace, and on that marketplace, uh, the most important part for researcher uh, goes uh, Jupyter Hub. In Jupyter Hub, uh, it's uh, in general very well known uh, uh, Jupyter user interface, and here you can choose. Um, one of uh, presented uh, environments for your uh, research analysis, but if that environment doesn't exist, but you need something else, you can um, ask maintainers uh, to provide you additional environment with uh, some specific uh, softwares. And after choosing one of uh, uh, particular environments, uh, you can start to do your own analysis. Uh, one of uh, the, mm, the most uh, or the best achievements uh, of virtual research environment is uh, interaction with uh, data lake. And what is uh, data lake? Data, data lake is uh, based on Rusho. 
uh, and uh, Rusho is uh, well, is open uh, open access to so software and uh, here uh, for instance you can see that we uh, have notebook <laughs> already and inside a uh, notebook if we want to add some some data from different type of experiments uh, we are cho we are choosing uh, a specific uh, specific scope and for instance here you can see like Fermilat, Game3Net and uh, for instance Atlas or other experiments uh, can be presented there and uh, uh, data also stored there then you can easily attach these data to your notebook and uh, operate with this data uh, as local and uh, that uh, also the, the most advantage that uh, uh, all these uh, mm, calculations or deployment is, is doing uh, remotely. You don't need to download on your own system. But also, it is also possible because uh, here you can see this uh, mark and this is possible to download the, this data to your local machine if you need. Um, another, another interesting uh, feature of a virtual research environment that uh, VRE is integrated with Rihanna. And what is a Rihanna? A Rihanna is a rep uh, reproducible or reusable uh, uh, analysis. Uh, so um, it's a bit more advanced than a uh, standard uh, Jupyter notebook. So in Jupyter notebook, you have like a, um, input output uh, user interface where you need to launch uh, each comment line by line. But for Rihanna, it's not needed. You can just use it like a remote uh, HPC. And for this uh, HPC, you just run your uh, your job and finally get your result. And re uh, another th uh, advantage of Rihanna, it supports many, uh, or not many, all of uh, current workflows, like here. And depends on your analysis how complicated it can be. Uh, and uh, Rihanna is using uh, all uh, deployment from from CERN or CNAF resources, so the, your analysis can be very powerful. Um, even so, basically you need just to have access and uh, to those services and uh, you may run very complicated things. Uh, now we are going to, to the demo. Uh, uh, for demo, uh, we decided to demonstrate uh -huh, we decided to demonstrate uh, uh, analysis for um, dark matter searching. We have like a um, hypothesis of uh, dark matter annihilation to, to gamma rays. We have uh, Fermilat, the, uh, the satellite detector, and this detector um, <coughs> gives us some data. Uh, data are stored in, in the data lake, uh, and uh, inside VRE we have uh, our analysis workflow, and the aim of this uh, workflow is to repeat the results which is mentioned in this paper, so just to reproduce such kind of figure. And now we are going to, yes, to the video, we didn't want to, to risk that to do it live. It's working, no? Uh-huh, yeah. So here we are uh, on the VRE, then we are going to Jupyter Hub um, using uh, AI our credentials to, to have access. Now we are launching. Now we we open a notebook with analysis. The next step is mm, attach data from the data lake. You see that we are choosing a specific scope, Fermilat. Uh, then looking for interest, uh, uh, interesting or not, not for our necessary files, then uh, each file should be re renamed and uh, these uh, new variables are attached to, to the notebook. Then it's, it's going right now. Mm. 
you see it adding to, to the notebook. Then we can see that all, all three files are attached and uh, green check marks show that everything fine is fine. Probably just restart kernel again. Yep. Then we are starting to do analysis. Before that it was local analysis and now since we are using Rusho we are renaming uh, and our variables to attach data. Since we have three files, then it takes for a while. and now analysis is working it calculates cross-section for that specific model which we defined before and finally we are we are plotting yeah plotting the the result And the result is pretty similar that it was in uh, in the paper, so we in in good agreement. So, uh, and some other um, TSPs we also have inside. Uh, not only for this particular case, but we have many many cases which will be also uh, deployed in a dark matter project. So it's not it's only one analysis but there are several analyses and we also planning to combine them together and probably as Lucas demonstrated to dem show that that limit <sighs> yep so thank you for attention and that's all thank you very much and as promised we do have time for more questions now about eight or nine minutes so fire away so thanks very much uh, interesting Did the Jupyter Notebook use Rihanna? Yeah, so, so I mean, the, Rihanna is kind of like a scale-out system, so you can interact with Rihanna from the Jupyter Notebook, mm -hmm. so it's like... I know it's possible, but did you do yeah, it? Yeah, okay, so yeah. Okay, so that's so, where the work is going. Yeah, so, so one of these uh, environments, so, so this one was like the Fermi environment, and then there's a different environment where the Rihanna client is installed. And then from the Jupyter Notebook, you can uh, connect to the Rihanna cluster and then submit your workflows mm -hmm. uh, from within the notebook, yeah. Okay, and the notebooks you ran on were running on what resources, CNAF? Uh, so, so um, I mean, the, yeah, so sorry. these are on EOS uh, provisioned resources on uh, CNAF, and then uh, the Rihanna cluster is running right now on certain resources, and, but we're uh, deploying it right now on CNAF resources. <laughs> okay, and those are EGI, I mean, those yeah. are EOSC, yeah. Compute Cloud yeah, exactly. stuff. Yeah. The last question is, as I saw in the Jupyter Network, you were doing a lot of, you renamed files. It sounded like you were maybe renaming the, the variables inside the files so that they match the expectations of the Jupyter no Notebook. I couldn't see what was going on, so I'm assuming that's kind of what was going on. All, the, all being done manually, you were typing. So is there a way to automate that process so that you can just take eight, eight inputs and run them through the pipeline and get the plots, eight plots, without having yeah, to go through it, that? Yeah, actually it is possible, but uh, here it was like a demonstration, but you need to rename it probably once and then they saved. I mean, that information is saved and you can repeat this analysis already with uh, saved variables. So conceivably you could package it up so that somebody who had mm -hmm. a random thing from IceCube could, mm -hmm. could push it through your workflow to get the plot and just sort of dump the, the data from IceCube in and get a plot back yeah. without having to do all the work you did. Yeah, in principle, yes, but if, if the data will match, I mean, previous, yeah, previous yeah, data. Mm -hmm. So, so the Rusio also has a Rusio Python client. So right now, this was kind of manually with this UI. And so that's uh, not necessary. I mean, work for small scale data. But you can use the Python API to 
querying Honestly, the entire right. uh, data mm -hmm. lake kind of uh, sure, sure. Uh, automatically. And the data lake is the escape data lake. Yes, so yes, that's yes, yes. Currently outside of EOSC, if you will. Right, that's right. Okay. Got so it. am I right in saying that this demonstration really showed quite a bit of EOSC interoperability, but yeah. behind the scenes, yeah. we're talking about quite tight integration yeah. here, not a loose composition put yeah. together. Right. That's good. Any other questions? Yeah. I, I got the mic, so <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, I, I abused this. Uh, no, uh, thank you very much. You mentioned the workflow, and yesterday in, in the keynote we had some examples of how much time is saved or some mm -hmm. resources are saved when you can automate this uh, workflow, right. uh, especially for the, the people who are redoing or replicating work. Do you have any idea of, of numbers uh, if, if a second researcher wants to use your yeah. workflow how much time yeah I, I can I can give a short uh, yeah I mean a, an estimate so that's one of the big issues for us so because uh, like the data is unique and so there are many kind of people outside of the experiments that want to get their question answered I have like a new theory and I want to the, the first question I have is it already excluded by the data of yes or no and so this is very difficult, but we cannot kind of put like one analysis for each theory, right? So that would be, so that's usually, so a new analysis is usually multiple years of graduate student time uh, to reanalyze uh, one of these archived uh, workflows <laughs> that usually you can turn around in like a few months and then mm -hmm. have already like a publication uh, on this. And so this okay, is, so yeah, so it's yeah, a pretty significant. I, I, I'm happy with one number. So if, yeah. if you could say you can, to a month, yeah. I mean, it's not going to be as optimal because, of course, you're reusing an analysis. But I mean, you very often it's already quite uh, good and it's uh, better than. Uh, yeah, I was you know. these details. I'll remember years. Become yeah. Months. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Last mm -hmm. questions for this demo. First, Christos and the gentleman here, and then we should open the floor yeah. to the first two demos. A very simple question. Uh, you, you you are talking here about the physical material, the dark matter, ma right. matter, right? Yeah. Yes. So there is a dark matter, which is biological material. Right. Have you ever tried to talk to those people? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Try to find, you know, <laughs> commonalities in your <laughs> yeah. We're still trying. <laughs> they haven't talked <laughs> to us yet. No, no, no. We did it. Sorry, before the gentleman behind. I would like to follow on the resources being used yes. uh, in the background through EOSC. Um, is there any kind of accounting? Uh, is this uh, the, the resource usage? Is yeah. that somehow connected to the user? Obviously, yes. Yeah. But also the research project. To yeah. the user so this is what we're trying. So this is one of the EOS uh, core services, this uh, accounting and monitoring. So this yeah. is uh, something that we're trying to uh, integrate because uh, right now it's still at the uh, level of a prototype where we kind of know. But for for example, for Rihanna, we have like a couple of hundred users, and at that point, you want to kind of monitor like who is uh, doing what. Right, and so uh, it's not there yet in this uh, prototype platform, but it's something we want to integrate. Mm -hmm. Would you consider using RAIDs, the uh, research activity Rates. identifiers? For our no, that, that'd be interesting to use, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, general questions now for any of the demonstrators? For the discussion. Yeah, yeah we're in the discussion Sorry. now. Okay, so uh, my question is uh, for the first two presentations. Then you probably then you show the uh, thematic stacks and horizontal services. Uh, what? Uh, okay, so horizontal services looks like they cannot be instantiated for uh, thematic stacks. They simply can be used for infrastructure. But what thematic services? They bring their own resources, or they have, uh, say, slice or provisioned resources from the common uh, EOSC. They can potentially bring their own resources, and we're not also restricted to the infrastructures for horizontal services. We are open to anybody else who believes that they are offering something that can be useful to anybody to onboard as a horizontal service, and that may come from a thematic service. Uh, okay, so in this case, I would say many questions for the, uh, from uh, say, thematic researchers from the main, not ICT. Uh, that they wanted majority of uh, job on configuring experimental or research environment is done by platform. So currently I see that this thematic services doesn't 
that help but does reduce job by creating thematic stacks. This means that they again will hire, pay, run uh, for engineers, programmers that work for half or one and a half year to run this infrastructure. But in some other presentation of the EOS future, we expect the intention to provide a common platform that provide all common services to configure the individual or instant uh, experimental facilities or research environment. So this is some kind of uh, uh, mismatch. All the thing. It needs to be a perverse to the common concept. It's up to whoever's providing the horizontal service to ensure they have sustainability in order to continue to provide that service. Whether that's centrally funded or not, I think is a question that we need to discuss for the next round of procurements. It's too late in the day for the current project. Yeah. 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 Any other questions, especially for the first demonstrators? I would have a question to all three uh, demonstrators here. Um, so sometimes you combine data sets. The data sets come with different uh, licenses. Are your platforms helping to put together the licensing and figure out the license that would be appropriate for the product? I mean, I can say for part of it is uh, maybe less of an uh, issue. So, uh, like a lot of these experiments have an open data type policy, and then there's like a uh, you know a specific uh, notion on how you're allowed to use the data. I mean, it's very free, and you can kind of the only requirement is that you're uh, supposed to cite it. Is everything CC by? That I mean the. the well, the, the data sets themselves, I don't think they have, like, I, I don't know, uh, I would need to check with the certain open data team what exactly uh, their license is, but I mean, because it's not, uh, I mean, so CC BY and so on, that's what I usually associate with, like, kind of text and, you know, like for your publication, I don't know if, how it applies to uh, event data. Uh, I think that would be uh, super interesting to know, uh, I'm sure, like, the uh, certain open data uh, people that they will know. Uh, but uh, yeah, so, so I think it goes uh, through the open data uh, programs of the individual experiments and then it's fine. I think in the sense how uh, like these uh, test science projects uh, help facilitate this, in our experience if you have projects that actually uh, demonstrate that you can actually do some uh, interesting science with these uh, open data and it's not just you're releasing the data and then it just rots away on a, uh, some archive, I think this is what uh, you know motivates the experiments to actually release the data. And so very often we try to work closely with people that you know consume this data in order to really demonstrate that this uh, has some added uh, advantage. And so in our experience, that works pretty well. At some point you have to attach a license. To the sure, yeah. I'm, sure, I'm sure there's a license attached. Just connected with that, do you have also DOIs for the data? Yes. Yeah, so we have different uh, data processes and they all come with DOIs and uh, so we have this raw data uh, which is kind of on the petabyte scale and then we have very uh, specialized data products that are on a separate archive and they come with a DOI and they can be cited and we encourage people to cite these data sets directly. Would any of the other demonstrators like to respond? Yes, in the case of the dashboard you can add the license that you want. For example, you can create a dashboard with even with a private uh, license. Yeah? By default, it's CC BY, but you can change it. And then the frames that are inside of the dashboard also contains as uh, a license. So, for example, you can create a public dashboard for everybody, but some of the frames can uh, be with private license of that kind of frame. So, for example, you can create one frame with MIT and another one with CCI and another one with another type of license. Yeah. So each frame is private, is independent. But it's up to the researcher or the data steward to figure out the license. It's up to the researcher. Yeah. Okay. So it doesn't assist much. And I can add, for example, for. <coughs> the CData net workflow, all the data that we use, and um, so the, the API queries the CData net database, and the CC BY uh, license data is what we then uh, get out of the data set. So even though we combine data, it's all CC BY license, so the output 
is also there. Yeah. That's the easy case. Yeah, that's the easy case. <laughs> so I've been told by my esteemed colleague Christos that we're out of time, so let's thank our contributors one more time. Thank you.